This is the Flory 8770 Harvester. And in this video, what we're gonna talk about is how to properly adjust this machine, how to operate it and operate it safely, and also how to perform basic maintenance on the machine. So let's get into it. First thing we need to do is check our tire pressures. Make sure the front and the rear tires are at 35 PSI. If you've got a brand new machine, there's a good chance that these tires were overinflated for shipping purposes. So make sure we get those, those tires at the right pressure. And then we wanna make sure we're starting out with a nice flat surface. A shop floor is ideal, but if you're out in the orchard, make sure you're at the uh, nice flat spot, maybe on, on the road where you can get a good setting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how to adjust the head, the pickup belts properly. So our adjustments are right here. We got one on the left and one on the right side. Anytime we make the adjustment, we want to pick the head off the ground, create slack in this chain, and then we'll crank this um, clockwise if we want to raise the head up, and then we'll crank it counterclockwise if we want to lower the head. One of the most important adjustments on these machines that get forgotten about a lot is the side wear plates here down on the bottom of the machine here in front, and the deflectors inside uh, of the uh, throat of the machine. Now anytime that you see nuts um, leaking out the side of the machine, so say you're picking up and you get out to check and you see that you're missing nuts but they're actually kind of on the outside of the machine, well your first instinct should not be to lower the pickup belt further into the dirt. What you need to do is you need to make your adjustments here on the side wear plate and this deflector. The bottom face of each of those, the side plate, the side wear plate, and the deflector should be flush with, with each other. So what happens sometimes is this deflector on the inside, the back end of it will get kicked up. And when that back end gets kicked up and out of adjustment, then nuts are allowed to kind of leak out the side of the machine. So first thing you need to check is if you're, if you're seeing nuts scattered on the outside of the machine that you know you should be picking up, get in here and make sure the back end of this deflector has not been kicked up. Chances are it has. You're gonna need a 9 16th socket and wrench to make that adjustment here and here. Get those down flush with each other. So also, um, let's talk about the height of these and where they should be setting relative to the ground. If your orchard floor has been prepped and is in good shape, you can get away with getting these just above or just barely touching the ground. A good indication is when we're setting the height of all of these, if we can get over here and give this with the head all the way down, if we can give this cab a shake and we actually get some play in it, that means my side wear plates are actually not digging into the ground and they're just off of it. So we can get in here and we can, it's just a visual inspection and you can actually see how I've got about a 16th or an eighth of an inch off the ground and uh, that's where I would start. What we have in here on the pickup belt is a set of wire teeth and rubber flaps behind it. And what we're wanting to do is get those wire teeth just off the ground, eighth of an inch, quarter inch off the ground. If you're in walnuts and the orchard's in good shape, you can probably even get a half inch off the ground. And it's really hard to be able to tell that from inside the machine. So the best way to find out where your head height is is actually get into the orchard, pick up a few trees, pick up your head and back up far enough to where you can see where your pickup belt was engaging on the ground. And you should be able to tell from the dirt whether or not those wire teeth are actually engaging the ground or if all you see is the marks from the rubber flaps. We really don't want to see those wire teeth in the ground. And if they are, we don't want them very aggressive in the ground. We've got to save the life of this pickup belt. And if you adjust it properly, you should get really good life out of these um, pickup belts. So. Once we get the pickup belt height adjusted where we want it, and we've got our side wear plate and our rock deflector setting on the ground where we want it, um, this pickup belt should be set for a while. And you'll just have to keep your eye on it, make sure you're still picking up. You should not have to adjust the tension on these pickup belts very often. Um, they, the, the bottom bearing down here on the pickup belt should stay right where it's at. And if we're going to make any kind of adjustment, the tension is going to be on the upper rear bearing of that pickup belt. But really, these pickup belts don't stretch. What will happen over time is that rear shaft on the pickup belt has rubber 
vulcanized on it. And over time, with wear and tear of dirt and rocks being in there, that rubber will eventually wear out and the diameter of that shaft will get smaller and smaller. And then that's when the pickup belt will actually start to get a little bit looser. So then that's when we can actually um, put some more tension on it. But that is not a daily um, um, item that we should be adjusting or even a weekly item. And really when you know um, that the tension or the, um, the tension is too loose on the pickup belt, you'll actually hear it uh, slip. But typically, that's not something that we need to be in here adjusting very often. And then back here on the middle of the machine, we've got what we call the primary dirt chain. Now there's a few different types of dirt chains that would come in your machine. If you've got the 8770XL, that would be the twin rod almond chain. Uh, those chains really don't stretch either, similar to the pickup belt. So there's really not a whole lot of maintenance on those primary chains. Um, if you've got the XL, if you've got the walnut bar chain, same thing, not a whole lot of stretch. Really the only chain that we have that will stretch uh, throughout the season would be the flat wire chain that you'll need to keep your eye on. So to adjust the tension on the center chain or the primary chain, it'll be this bearing back here and these push bolts back here that will actually stretch that chain out and tighten it as needed. Now, what we're looking for in the primary chain with what's too loose, what's too tight, is the rule of thumb that we use is right down here. It's going to be difficult to see, but we'll get you a shot of it. We want to see a little bit of a sag underneath the chassis of that primary chain, and it's about a three-finger width gap of what that sag should look like. So if you use that kind of as your um, indicator of how tight or how loose that chain should be, that's going to be your indicator on the primary chain. Now on the secondary chain, or the elevator chain, sometimes it's called, uh, same as the primary. We're going to have um, either the twin rod almond chain, we're going to have the flat wire almond chain, or the walnut bar chain. That's going to be the typical setup. Of course, we got pecan bar chain as well, uh, even hazelnut twin rod. But anyways, if you got the twin rod or the bar chain, same thing, you're not going to see a whole lot of stretch. The, the uh, flat wire is the one chain that you might see that stretch more frequently. And anytime we're adjusting the tension, it's going to be back here on this bearing and this push bolt right here. Now, the proper tension, we really don't have a sight indicator like we do on the primary. Um, so really the best thing to do is when you get a brand new machine, just get used to the uh, tension, the way it feels as you push on it from this point of the elevator chain, and that should really give you a good indication. It's not an exact science of how these things should be tensioned. It's all on the bar chain and the twin rod. It's all friction drive. Um, it doesn't really need to be real, real tight, but just tight enough so it's not slipping on us. Each chain type is going to come with different side seals. So if you've got the twin rod almond chain in here, you're going to have the UHMW blocks that are the side seals. Those really don't require any kind of adjustment. So as you can tell, the twin rod chain doesn't stretch, doesn't really have any side seals that need adjusting. It's pretty much a maintenance-free um, setup. If you've got the bar chain, you'll have rubber seals that just touch the very top surface of that bar chain and you'll have to keep your eye on that throughout the season and make sure as that rubber wears you'll have to slide those brackets down and make sure that we, we have engagement on top of those on top of that chain and the same thing goes with the flat wire chain you'll have some rubber side seals um, or you might even have some plastic or steel side seals but either way whatever side seals you choose they'll need to be engaged with those chains and those brackets will be lower throughout the season as those parts wear out. Now, what we have in our almond setup is what we call bounce shafts. There's three of them on the primary chain, and these bounce shafts can be adjusted uh, depending on how aggressive you want to bounce that chain and let dirt fall through. Of course, the more aggressive you are, the more wear and tear over time you're going to put on your chain. So you can adjust these right here with, uh, there's a slot in the way this bearing is mounted, and you can you can loosen these bolts right here and pivot these bearings around this bolt right here and either raise them up into the 
chain so it bounces more or lower it down all the way in the slot so there's just a light little bounce. There's a couple adjustments that you can make on the fan. Um, the, we've got the lower wind board right here. That's going to be all the way up in the almond setting and it's going to be all the way down for walnuts or pecans. So if you're doing multiple crops uh, during the season, just know that that's an adjustment that you can make. Otherwise, you're going to leave this alone. The other adjustment is the top wind board right here internally and this is adjusted from inside the cab. But what I want to point out to you is how that, how that works. So inside the cab on the display screen, it'll actually give you a readout of how far off the end of that wind board is off of the chain. So we can raise and lower that wind board and what that does is it affects the amount of suction that we get from the fan, but also the lower we get, you can imagine if we got a heavy crop in here, especially in walnuts or pecans, if we get too close to the chain, we can plug it up. So depending on the crop size that you have, how fast you're picking up, we can adjust this and of course from the cab you can look out the window to see um, what's coming out the discharge of the fan and you will also check the cart and see how clean the product is so here's your here's your wind board it sits right in here and that's adjusted that pivots about this point right here and you make that adjustment from inside the cab okay so now let's talk about the operation of the 8770 the first thing you're going to notice when you key on the machine you're going to get a black screen on the display screen with a little white clock in the middle let that go before you crank on the machine. Once you see the Flory logo spinning, then crank the machine on. Uh, the reason for that is as we key it on, the computer is booting up, the plus one computer and also the engine computer. So go ahead and let all that stuff boot up first and then crank it on. Sometimes if we get in a hurry and we get ahead of the computer, we'll get some false uh, fault codes that might pop up on us. So that's the first thing we need to know. And now let's look at the controls of the cab. So here on the joystick, I've got six buttons and pretty much everything I need to operate this machine in and out of the field is going to be right here. And we'll get into details of all of these. So the top left one is what we call feed roll speed up. And we'll get into more of what that does, but I want you to know the location of it. This one turns our fan on and off. These two buttons will move our hitch in and out, and we'll talk more about that top right button here turns all of our dirt chains, all three dirt chains on and off. And this bottom one right here will turn just the back chain, the elevator chain on and off. And again, I'll get more into detail of why we have some of these controls here. Also here on the upper console, we've got our parking brake switch and we've got some auxiliary buttons here. If you've got a cart with augers on it and an auto unload, you're always going to have this on. And so when the shuttle truck engages your cart, it will automatically unload into the shuttle truck. If you've got a cart with a uh, sticker mover on it, you're going to use these to open and close the, the sticks that are collected in the stick box. We've got manual unload down here. Again, if you're not set up with an auto unload cart, cart you can still use your manual unload button here. Um, we've got power assist for those four-wheel drive units and uh, we've got our lights over here. Now here on the lower console, we've got our ha hazard lights, we've got our ignition switch, we've got our throttle control, which is a rocker switch, we've got our AC controls right here, and then we've got some more auxiliary switches down here. If you got some optional paddle sweeps or DV sweeps, you'll control the up and down right here with them. Okay, so let's walk through the display screen so we can understand what's going on here. So on our display screen, you're gonna see where we've got the air filter restriction indicator right here. We've got engine temperature, death level, and the fuel level. We've got miles per hour, uh, as well as the tachometer around it. And then these three indicators, chains, fan, elevator, they will light up green whenever they are on. So our, the two main display screens that we will be on most of the time that will show our gauges will be this top one right here. It will show these gauges and if we click over here to the secondary you'll notice that really these three right here are the only things that changed. Our fuel and our def levels stay there as, long, as well as the chain fan and elevator indicator. So we've got battery now and we've got 
oil pressure here. If we keep moving on, this third screen is where we're going to do a lot of our adjustments. So we've got some factory set um, screens already in place. So we've got Almond, what we call high performance, and you can see we get the factory presetting of 900 RPMs on the fan. Elevator chain is 80%, the windboard is three inches off the top of the dirt chain, and our rotary trap <clears throat> is low. If we toggle over to Almond Enviro mode, you'll notice that the suction fan RPM dropped down to 300. Uh, elevator is 80%, windboard is now at two inches, so we're trying to pull a little bit more suction. Rotary trap is still set on low. We've got wallet and pecan setting as well, and then we've got a custom setting. So any one of these screens that you're in, if you use this bottom arrow, you can get into each one of these numbers, and then from there, use your left and right buttons to make your adjustments. So I can go 600 RPM, I can speed up, my elevator to 90%, I can pinch down my windboard to one, and if I want to, I can crank up my rotary trap to medium, low, or high. And on all three of these factory preset screens, if any time I get off and I don't know where I started from, I can just hold down the O button, and it'll take me back to the factory presetting, which, point out on Enviro mode, is actually 600 RPM. So going to the next screen down here, the bottom right, this is where all of the job hours are going to be. So I've got uh, engine oil filter, fuel filter, all the filters here, the chain hours, all these can be reset. Job hours, job fuel, the only thing that cannot be reset is the engine hours. That will, that will stay the same. Units, language, we can go to Spanish if we want. And again, um, keep in mind, anytime we go to any of these display screens, these different screens here, the fuel and def levels will always um, remain on that screen. Now over here, we've got this gear icon here with a one on it, and that's gonna show the engine faults. So anytime we have an engine fault, this is gonna light up yellow, and so you click on it, and your faults will show up right here on the screen. Same thing with the gear icon with the number two. That's gonna be your machine faults, and those will show up right here. And so you'll get a number, you'll get actually three numbers, an FMI, an SPN, um, and an OC. That's, those numbers can all be found in the back of the operator's manual to kind of further explain what they are. The OC is this the, um, the occurrences, how many times that fault is actually uh, shown up and the um, FMI and the SPN are actually related to the fault code. So it's important to get familiar with this. If it's an engine active fault code, then that is gonna be, that is gonna require a CAT technician, Caterpillar technician to come out and work on the machine. If it's a machine active fault, then that's when you'll call either Flory Direct, if you're a direct sale customer, or your Flory dealer to come out and work on the machine. Now, anytime you get these fault codes, make sure you look them up in the back of the operator's manual. It's gonna show you what it is, and it could be something very simple that you can do. It might be low uh, levels of the coolant or um, water in the fuel, and you just need to drain the bowl. So anyways, Get familiar with these, and a good practice is have the operator take a picture with his phone of the fault, and that way we've got record of it, and we can pass that along to who needs it. Also here on the display screen, we can toggle between high and low gear for field and road range, and then we have our manual purge button for our reversing fan right here. Okay, so now let's talk about um, actually the work we're doing in the field with this. So the first thing we need to do is we're always going to double check our, our depth of our pickup belt. So we've done all the setup outside the field on a nice flat uh, piece of ground. And then once we get in the field, we're going to pick up a few trees, pick the head up, back it up, get out, check, make sure we're, we're not missing any nuts. If we are, let's make the proper adjustments 
if we look like we're too deep, let's make the proper adjustments. So double check the depth, even after you've done it outside the field, get it inside the field, and we still gotta double check it. So starting the row, when we begin a row and we start picking up, we wanna make sure that the head is off the ground, okay? And I keep talking about head going up and down. We've got foot pedals right here inside the cab that raise and lower the heads. So head needs to be off the ground before we start and then we're gonna turn the chains on. So that button uh, we pointed out on the joystick that turns the shafts, uh, the chains on, that's gonna turn all three of them on. Now, if we're gonna start a row and our cart and our harvester are not lined up, say we got a real tight turn that we gotta make and the cart and harvester are not lined up, that's when we're gonna leave the elevator chain off, okay? And that's because we don't want the harvester throwing nuts uh, past the cart if they're not directly in line with each other. So in the situation where we've got, the, we've got a tight turn to make and we gotta start picking up nuts before the cart and the harvester are lined up, we're gonna leave the elevator chain off and we're gonna start picking up. And once things get lined up, that's when we push the button on the joystick that says elevator on. Now, the, the design of the machine on the display screen, like we showed, we've got those three boxes that will light up green on the display screen. Um, if we are picking up nuts and that back elevator chain is off, that light will blink and you'll also get an audible beep that reminds you, hey, you're picking up nuts, but nothing's going in the cart yet. So you'll have that audible reminder. You can go a couple trees before things get plugged up, but if you go too far, then you're gonna plug up the machine. So don't forget that. We gotta eventually turn that elevator chain back on. So as we begin the row, we've got the head off the ground, we've turned the chains on, we, get the, we turn the fan on with our joystick. So let that fan spool up, it's hydraulically driven, so we gotta give it a few seconds, let it spool up. You'll hear that audible uh, once the fan is all the way spun up, drop the head, and then we go. We don't ever wanna drop the head and then start messing with buttons, turning things on and off. When we put the head in the ground, we wanna be moving. Now, when we begin that row and we're going down the row, what we're trying to do is stay right in the middle of that wind row. So we've got a nice view right here through this window that's gonna show the operator where that wind row is. Stay in between best you can. And then it's also good practice to look over your right shoulder at what's coming out that fan. As long as we see a nice steady stream of debris coming out that fan, we know things are working properly. If you don't see anything coming out, chances are we're plugged up, or you might see <clears throat> too much coming out, and maybe we're actually pulling nuts and we need to adjust that windboard. So now let's talk about how to end the row properly and make sure that we pick up every last nut at the end of the row. So something that I like uh, for operators to keep in mind is the pickup belt is in line with that front tire where it's actually engaging the dirt. Now the operator sits in front of that about right here. Now your line of sight through that bottom window, when you last can see that the end of that windrow that you're picking up is right about here, okay? And we need to go a little bit past that windrow to make sure we get every last nut. So we actually wanna make sure we're engaged in the ground that much further. So by the time that you lose sight of the wind row to the time that pickup belt is actually engaged in the ground, you've got a good six to eight feet and you need to go a couple more feet past that. So early on we talked about that feed up, uh, the speed up, sorry, the feed roll speed up right here in the front of the machine. What that's doing is as we hold down that button, that front rotary trap speeds up to maximum speed. And uh, as we get to the end of the row, we really don't have anything in front of us uh, pushing back to help us flip those nuts onto the pickup belt. So as that wind row gets thinner and thinner at the very end, we need that extra speed from that rotary trap to help flick those last few nuts onto the pickup belt. So keep that in mind that we're actually picking up right here and we lose sight of that windrow way up here and we need to stay engaged in that ground even a couple more feet past that windrow while holding down the entire time of that um, speed up on the feed roll and that will help us 
get every last nut. So once we do that, we're holding down, holding down, holding down all the way till we get past the windrow. We let go, we pick the head up. We can turn the chains on or we could actually even, um, I mean, sorry, we can turn the chains off or we can even leave them on. Uh, if you're making a left hand turn, best practice is to turn that fan off so we're not blowing dirt out into the road. If you're making a right hand turn, a lot of guys will leave that fan on and blow back into the orchard, which is just fine. And uh, if you're coming out of the row and you've got some uneven terrain, that's when you're going to want to extend your hitch out away from the cart so your cart and the back of your harvester don't get into each other. But remember, um, if you do that, when you get back into the next row, you want to bring that hitch all the way back in so we're throwing nuts into the cart and we're not missing any. So that's the basic in and out, how to start a row, uh, how to go down a row, and how to end a row on the 8770 harvester. All right, so now let's get into the maintenance of the 8770 harvester and ensure that you have a good season without any kind of breakdown. So fuel filters, we've got three fuel filters on this engine. They're all here on the back side, at least the primary and the secondary are. Primary's got a water bowl on the bottom of it. Probably going to need to get into that daily, drain the water out of that primary fuel filter. And then we've got an inline fuel filter right here on the back side of this tank. Those three filters will need to be replaced after the first 50 to 100 hours uh, on a new machine. And then after that, it's going to be every 500 hours. The crankcase breather filter is also back here. This big yellow one right here on the back side of the engine. Um, that's going to be every 1,000 hours you're going to replace that filter, so about two seasons. And make sure when we get into that crankcase filter, make sure we're in a very clean environment when we do it. The engine oil. Um, unlike some other brands, this uh, engine does not come with any kind of break-in oil. So you will start the, uh, the intervals at 250 hours, replace the oil filter and the um, engine oil at 250 hours. We've got the cooling package up here in front of the engine bay. In order to get to it, to clean it out, you need to flip this visor. And then if you undo these three clips, this grill should just pop straight out. Get the grill out of the way, and then we've got access to our fuel killer or AC condenser and then we can pop open this door and I have access to our oil cooler and our radiator. Make sure we're getting in there on a daily basis blowing that out so it doesn't get plugged up with dirt. The def tank on this machine is located here um, next to the fuel tank. Make sure anytime that we're gonna fill this with def that we clean the entire area around this cap before we open up this cap. We can't let any dirt get inside the def tank. So take special caution whenever we're filling the tank up right here and make sure we're using good def. Back here we've got the def pump and inside that def pump is the def filter and I want to point that out. Um, it's right underneath this rubber cap here. Every 500 hours you're going to be replacing the filter inside of here so pretty much once a season. We've got two batteries located back here as well. And um, we've got our master disconnect switch and this wait to disconnect light. Now what you'll see is when you turn off the engine, this light will still be on. And we want to make sure that we never turn this machine off while that light is still on. There's a couple things going on. Uh, first, the def pump is purging all the def lines back into the tank. We don't want any def left in the lines. It'll crystallize and it could do damage to uh, the after treatment system. Also, the computers are um, downloading information and processing. So um, we want to make sure that anytime we're going to flip this off, this light has also turned off. This really isn't a switch that needs to be used on a daily basis. It's primarily used for winter storage. Um, of course, you can use it as a safety um, device where when it's off you can actually padlock it right here so nobody can uh, operate the machine or start it up because the battery will be dead and this will be off. Also over here are three high amp fuses and I like to point those out um, for troubleshooting sake 
So if you got any electrical power issues, you've probably checked the fuses inside the cab, which I'll show you in a second. But um, these uh, high amp fuses are um, something that also can't be forgotten about if we're trying to troubleshoot electrical issues. And so the fuses are inside the cab, right in here. All right, let's talk about the air filtration system on this machine. So we've got our intake screen right here. We need to make sure that this stays free and clear of any kind of leaves or debris. From that intake, we've got a tube that comes into our pre-cleaner box up here. That pre-cleaner box is separating a good majority of the dirt that we're going to see in the intake. So we've got spinner tubes in there that's separating the dirt from the air, collecting in this box. And then out that box, we've got a suction created by our exhaust pipe that's pulling the dirt collected in this box out the exhaust. Right here is a check valve, and this check valve needs to be oriented in a certain, po certain position. So um, anytime that you're replacing this check valve, make sure you take uh, note of the instructions that are actually on it. It'll show you the arrows, and it'll show you which way is the top, because there is a flap in there that hangs down and um, that flap prevents any kind of backflow back into our air filter. So as long as that flap, that check valve is in place, then that protects any kind of heat uh, exposure to this element. So that's how the pre-cleaner system works. We've got an access panel right here for the pre-cleaner box. Maybe halfway through the season, open it up, check it out, blow it out if it's getting plugged up with too much dirt. Otherwise, this should stay pretty much maintenance free and you might have to replace those tubes every few years as they get worn out. Now below that is the air filter. And these air filters, as you can see, are quite large with the combination of our pre-cleaner box and this large capacity air filter. You should get very, very good life on this filter. And we wanna use the display screen to tell us when it's time to change these filters out. We don't wanna get in the habit of doing it on a daily or even every two days we want to wait and watch that gauge. So what happens on that gauge is at 75% restriction, you'll start, you'll get the icon for the air restriction that'll just start to blink at you. And that's basically giving you a warning saying, hey, look, you're getting close, but you can go ahead and operate um, and continue throughout the day. When you get maxed out, that's when it'll start to blink rapidly and you'll actually get an audible uh, noise to go with it. At that point, it's time to change that air filter. But let's use the uh, display screen to let us know when to get in here. And the reason for that is we want to be in these filters as little as possible. Um, these tier four final engines cannot take any bit of dirt. And so we really need to protect those engines. So the least amount of times we're actually exposing uh, this to the elements, the better off we are. These will come with blue Donaldson air filters make sure you're continuing to use Donaldson air filters. It cannot be any other brand. If you do, you're gonna be voiding the warranty. So only replace it with the Donaldson air filters. And I strongly suggest that you use the blue. Uh, they are a little bit more expensive than the white ones, but they have quite a bit more capacity. And again, we're trying to get in here as little as possible. So it's worth the investment to buy uh, the high capacity air filters. Every three primary filters that we're replacing, we're going to replace that inner safety filter when we do that. So take special care. Anytime you open this up, make sure we're in a clean environment. There's no machines running around, stirring up dust. Uh, we want to make sure we're in a clean environment anytime we open this up. Okay, the tires and wheels. Back here, we've got uh, this hub. Uh, after the first 50 hours, pretty much the first week you run this machine, you're gonna replace this oil in this hub. And we're gonna, we want it halfway full. So this drain plug right here, we want sitting at about three o'clock or the nine o'clock position. Um, once it's, that's where we're gonna fill it. So that'll help us uh, figure where halfway is on these. So, and then after that, it's gonna be once a season on these hubs. If we wanna ever tow this machine, we've got these caps right here on the hub. You will just remove this, these two bolts here Take that cap, flip it up on its, flip it around, and the nipple will be pushing in on the hub, and then that will disengage. Of course, you got to do both sides um, to tow the, the machine. Now, we don't want to tow this machine uh, any kind of long distance or any kind of fast speed. Keep it under 10 miles an hour, 
It's just there to get you out of a tough spot. Now the fan drive. This is a hydraulically driven fan. Uh, the older models used to be off of the engine. This is off of a hydraulic motor. This is all pretty much maintenance free. We are not changing shivs uh, in order to change our fan speed. All that is changed from the cab with the push of a button. So this drive system should basically be maintenance free. Um, there's really no grease points or anything in here. On the hydraulic system, we've got, we've got six pressure ports right here to do any kind of troubleshooting where you can check your pressures. Also the proper pressure read, readout is located right here for your convenience. The hydraulic oil filters, we've got two orange charge filters right here for each one of these pumps. And we've got two orange filters back here on the rear of the machine. Those four filters will need to be replaced after the first 50 hours of runtime on a new machine. And then it's gonna be every 500 hours or typically once a season. So we got two pump stacks right here. Behind those pumps is a double pump gearbox or double pump drive that's bolted on the flywheel of the engine that's driving these pumps. That gearbox, that sandwich between the engine and those pumps, it has oil in it that needs to be replaced every two years. The AC system is right here on the ins inside wall of this cab and the drain hoses are right below it underneath here. And we just need to make sure that those drain hoses stay free and clear of any kind of dirt and debris. They will have a tendency to get uh, mud on them. And so as long as we're seeing drips of water draining through there, everything's working properly. If you don't, might need to stick a toothpick up there and keep that free of any kind of buildup. Uh, what happens is if they do get plugged up and we ignore it, well, the water will fill up in the AC system and then that will overflow into the cab. So keep those free and clear. And uh, your filter on the AC system, which is accessed from inside the cab, keep that clean and you should have little uh, issues with your AC system. So some more maintenance on the cleaning chains is on the pickup belt. We've got the wire teeth that we need to keep our eye on. When they're brand new, those wire teeth are two inches long. And when they get to about an inch and a quarter long, that's when we need to replace them. So keep your eye on those wire teeth and make sure they don't get worn too far down. When they do get worn too far down, we lose the flexibility in those. And then we start putting stress on the actual pickup belt. And of course, that can be a really expensive um, replacement item. So keep your eye on the wire teeth. Um, and then also we've got two connecting rods, one on the primary chain and one on the secondary or elevator chain. And we want to replace those connecting rods every 200 hours. Um, and how we do that is we got these rods right in here and we're going to take the new rod and we're going to hammer out the old rod with the new rod and just replace it. It also helps to get some uh, clamps or vice grips in here, kind of help take the tension off of the chain when we're doing it. If we let those connecting rods get too far and get too worn out, they actually kind of get a camshaft shape to them and they can be really difficult to replace. So just every 200 hours, just make habit of knocking out that old rod with the new rod and you shouldn't have any issues uh, throughout the season. Other thing to keep in mind is uh, keep an eye on the clips that hold the connecting rods together. Yeah, uh, every couple seasons, there's a good chance that the material that that's working right here will get thin enough, uh, and you want to catch that before they break. So we've got the the kits, the replacement kits for those clips. So every couple of years, you're probably going to need to keep your eye on those clips that hold the rods in place. So those are kind of your maintenance items to keep those chains going, keep the tension on those chains, proper tension on them, and you should get good life out of them. Okay, so the daily grease schedule on this machine is really we got four grease points. We've got a grease point up here and a grease point down here. And the same is true on the other side of the machine. And that's it. Those four points are our daily grease items that we need to worry about. And then here in our uh, chain drive system, we've got roller chain in here. Really, uh, these are better off left dry or maybe a little WD-40, but don't, don't put a bunch of grease on here because all they're going to do is collect a bunch of dirt and uh, wear these sprockets out faster than they should be. So um, really little maintenance in that area. The same thing is going on up in this box here. So we want a WD-40 at the most, and those are good to go. 
And then all of our support bearings that we have throughout the side of the machine, on both sides of the machine, all these bearings here, we're going to want to hit those every 100 hours. One pump every 100 hours. The tendency is to over grease these bearings and uh, a lot of times I'll see grease outside of the seal here and once that's done these bearings are pretty much toast. So one pump every 100 hours and these, these bearings will easily last a season probably more. Um, so don't over grease these bearings. That's the worst thing for these. Now last thing I want to talk about is keeping this engine bay clean and free of debris. Um, they will have a tendency because you guys know the environment these are in we can get nuts in here we can get leaves in here sticks dirt whatever daily basis depending on your conditions maybe even twice a day should be getting in here and cleaning all of this out with some air blow it out and the same thing is true for behind the cab this area but here behind the cab has a tendency to build up with debris and we've got a um, a sensor down there for our head lift system and if that if, if we get a bunch of buildup there where that uh, sensor is then it can't do its job and so the head lift system won't work the way it should uh, usually what happens is that head won't be able to pick up all the way because we've got a sensor proximity sensor that's gauging the height of our, our, our head lift and so if we allow the trash to build up in there we're not going to be able to lift that head up all the way so keep this free and clear keep this free and clear and that way we're reducing fire hazards and letting everything work the way it should. All right, thanks for watching this video on the 8770. It's important to know that everything that we went over is in the operator's manual that comes with this machine. Uh, all the engine fault codes, all the machine fault codes, you can find those in the back. All of the filters that we talked about are all here in the back. Um, all of the fluids that this machine needs, the type of fluid and how much to use, all here found in the back all of the warning icons that you're going to see on the, the display screen. All of it's here in the operator's manual. So get familiar with this, with this book. It's going to really help you um, keep this machine going and get the most life out of it.